Hello, I'm Peter Cowley. This is the podcast version of a presentation that I gave at BET in January 2008. I'd like to start with a quick question. There are three items of technology on the screen. A flip chart, a laptop computer, and a television set. Which one's the odd one out? OK, time's up. If you said the television set, you're right. Why? Because the other two items are creative tools, whereas the television set is just for viewing passive information. Hold that thought. We'll come back to it later. In 2002, the Department for Education and Skills, as they were then called, set up the Classrooms of the Future initiative and invited partner local authorities to come up with ideas for their vision of a classroom of the future. The London Borough of Richard Benoit on Thames was one of the successful bidders and in partnership with three schools, Midlands Primary School, Strathmore Special School and Greycourt School, set up the Ingenium project. This is what one of the classrooms looks like from above. In a moment we'll be going inside, but just for the moment, this is what it looks like from outside. Before we go in, let's just have a quick history lesson. If you go over the last 150 years in terms of classroom design, what I think is remarkable is not so much how much has changed, but actually how little has changed. Still the students are in rows behind desks, facing the front and the teachers at the front. And once we even we get to the present day, what's remarkable also is that apart from it being in colour, it's pretty much the same. The ceiling's a bit lower, the wood's a bit cheaper, but other than that, there's not a lot that's changed. OK, so how did we arrive at our idea for a classroom of the future? Well, we had a team of really quite important people helping us out. We've already mentioned the uh, Department for Education and Skills and our partner schools. We had a number of commercial partners too, and there are some of them. And we also had uh, other firms helping us out in terms of the planning, the design and the construction of the buildings. And gluing it all together was Capgemini and Ernst Young, who were very useful to us in terms of helping us to look through to the future for our vision of our classroom. And a huge influence throughout the entire project was Professor Stephen Heppel, whose vision and ideas helped to keep the whole project on track, and who remains a very important influence to this day. OK, so more specifically, how did we get here? Well, here is our design team. And I'm not just paying lip service to the fact that uh, there were many children and young people involved in the project. Their ideas were instrumental in forming and shaping what the classroom looked like. We spent many, many hours thinking through ideas, thinking through shapes and how things might be set out and arranged and so on. And once we'd got past what uh, I call the Baco foil stage, this, this idea that every civilization seems to have, that in 30 years' time everyone's going to be walking around in silver suits, once we got past that idea and really into what the learning was all about, what was remarkable was what the children were saying that they wanted to see. Or actually, we began from what they didn't want to see. What the students didn't want was that sort of shoe box with corners that you're shoehorned into uh, for your learning experience. They didn't want that. Top of the list, surprisingly, of what they did want, however, was a toilet. But there were other sorts of things that you'd expect them to say as well, like light and colour, space to move around in, and um, somewhere on the list was computers and stuff, but they certainly didn't have a vision of a classroom of the future just being an entire sort of electronic experience. A huge um, influence, again, on the project was our lead architect, John O'Mara, from Future Systems. And here is one of the photographs that he used as a vision for the classroom. You might be surprised to see a photograph of the yolk of a raw egg. But if we bring in the picture that you saw earlier and superimpose it, I think you get the idea. The match is not just close, it's exact. What a huge inspiration for a really organically shaped building. Let's just see that again. OK, it's time I brought you inside now. This is what the classroom looks like with the main doors opened at the front. You can see already a very wide whiteboard in front of you. Let's go inside a bit further. That's what the main board at the front looks like. 
over on the right hand side you can see that we have colour coded zones and areas with matching furniture. Ditto over on the left. There's a view back with the doors now mostly shut. There's a better view of the main whiteboard. Up in the ceiling you can see some uh, blue discs. Those are actually sponges, or at least they're cushioned. They're designed to keep the acoustic at a tolerable level, because with all that hard surface everywhere it would otherwise be a pretty, uh, pretty noisy situation. As it is, the, or the, uh, the sound experience is lively, but it's certainly um, pleasant. You can also see there the low energy light bulbs. Uh, they're actually fluorescent, uh, high frequency fluorescent, so they're dimmable. And they're also daylight balanced. A uh, very strong emphasis of the room is a lot of light, and what we didn't want was uh, that sort of horrible yellowy-greeny light. So uh, the light that they give out is very much the sort of light that you experience uh, in daylight situations. The floor might be worth mentioning a little bit as well. Underneath the grills around the outside is the heating element which runs around, and also a set of flaps that open and close to adjust automatically the environmental conditions. There are no air conditioning, as you might expect, in the building, because, of course, uh, these days air conditioning is very much a no-no when it comes to saving energy. So instead, the building is designed very much like a chimney, and uh, the air exchange happens through convection. OK, well, I've mentioned a few things in outline there. You can see happening on the screen now is a very speeded up view of the elements that constructed the classroom arriving on site and being uh, bolted into place. And there's some shots, general shots, of both the classroom at Greycourt School and also the one at Meadland School, so you can see the similarities and the differences. We wanted an innovative physical space, and I certainly think we've got that. Now, in terms of the overall uh, features and benefits of the building, first of all, it's replicable. Effectively, from a design point of view, it's an upside-down boat, and in fact a boat builder has uh, actually constructed the GRP segments, uh, sections that you're seeing being bolted together while I'm speaking. It can be put together on-site pretty rapidly. In fact, it arrives on two trucks. It's mass-producible from the moulds, it's a low energy building. You can see already there there's probably an inner and an outer skin you can see being put together and between those two skins is obviously insulation. It's a versatile space because it's such an open space uh, that you can move the furniture around pretty much as you'd like. Uh, it can be used for lots and lots of different purposes. We've used it for concerts, for drama, uh, for conventional lessons. Pretty much everything from Latin to RE has happened in there. Uh, so it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very versatile space. All the activities that happen in the Ingenium are designed to exploit the features of the building. It very much fits in with a kinesthetic style of learning. It's multipurpose, it's versatile. You can see a few shots there of a concert actually happening one summer. We use green screen technology a lot. Here's a, a, a production happening. Uh, in fact, it is a Latin class, an after-school Latin class, putting together a play in Latin. And you can see one of the frames from the resulting video on the right-hand side. Somebody once told me that in Danish, the word for learning and the word for teaching are the same word. And this is a pretty good illustration of that. So you could say, uh, forgive my Danish accent, uh, dansk, I'm learning Danish. Or you could say, I'm yeah, teaching in Danish. It's the same word. It says something about the Scandinavian attitude to learning yeah, and teaching. But here's, here's that in practice if you want to get inside the gym. You're watching some video segments here from uh, a year 10 video that they made. Uh, in fact, this is happening in the Ingenium, but they took some pictures from the internet of the interiors and using green screen technology put themselves into it. But they're actually sat there in front of the tables in the Ingenium, although it doesn't look as if they are. Year 10 class making teaching and learning materials for Year 8. So the lehrer uh, uh, principle in practice, if you like. OK, well, enough about me, enough from me. Let's hear what some of the students say about their experiences of being inside the Ingenium. Also, everyone learns differently. So if you always have the thing that everyone's just sitting there listening to the teacher and then working their books, it's some people might work better using the whiteboards or using the laptops, using it visually. So it works better for some people. It kind of depends how you, how you learn. What's interesting there is that the student has uh, synthesised in effect VAK, visual, auditory and kinesthetic, different styles of learning, and how the room particularly suits um, those different styles of learning. So there's pretty much something for everybody. I think that um, sitting in a box sort of linear classroom is a bit sort of 
um, more claustrophobic, if you like. Cause, it's a bit tedious. Yeah. Because this, it's um, very unique and it's got all the light flooding in. And so, um, well, I think light makes you sort of like um, engage more into the lesson. It's more positive, yeah. You're yeah. more awake as well. Because when you're just in boxing and it's just it's like very the same, dark. Because it's just really dark and it's just like, yeah. So as you heard before, they didn't want a shoebox with corners, they wanted curbs. They didn't want it to be dark, they wanted it to be bright and airy. And they didn't want it to be gloomy, they wanted it to be exciting and interesting. I think it definitely works because in the Ingenium you have a sense that you can move about, you can work as a group together with people, you can say what you think and you're not silenced most of the time. Does it make any difference? Yes, it does. Why? Because you feel much more comfortable. You can confident and confident like, you on can what you're doing, like and it's, it's definitely yeah. much better. Your voice is heard. You feel much more like you're not confined to yourself. You feel much more confident and willing to give your ideas in a lesson. Whereas so you won't be sure in some lessons. Do I put my hand up? Am I right? Am I wrong here? It doesn't matter because yeah. you say it anyway. The chances are that if you walked into a conventional classroom and started moving the furniture around as a student, you'd be in trouble. Well, in the Ingenium, you have to. You have to move the furniture around to suit the task that you're actually engaging in at the time. So uh, it's a bit like there's a removable for removal firms in uh, in the classroom when you've got a class in there. I, I think exercise books are like the most formless. They're just they're so boring, and no, each page in your exercise book is practically the same. The only difference is a different colour of pen, really. And even though you might think that if we did begin to use the boards every day, it would become the same thing. It's just not. It, the boards encourage group work, they encourage people to say what they really want to say. It's, yeah. You can write something on the board without having to speak about it and other people can see it. If you're embarrassed to say it, you can just write it, everyone can see it and you've got your ideas out because lots of people are embarrassed to speak or whatever. And it's just, if you're writing in your book, you get your ideas down in your book and you might never tell them to everyone else and then you've lost a good idea or, and it's just the boards encourage that more. Now here's something that we weren't expecting to find, but it's quite interesting, is that when you give students access to huge amount of whiteboard space, in fact there are five huge whiteboards in the classroom in effect, um, the extent to which they're willing to take risks and share their thoughts with each other increases. And we weren't expecting to find that. Okay, so what is it that we're actually learning? Well. First of all, learning definitely happens faster when you're in the Ingenium, and it may well be because if you're on show, that generally means that you have to be on task. The arrangement uh, in the classroom is a cooperative one. Pretty much everybody faces everybody else. There are no hiding places, if you like. And I think because of that, you tend to be more focused on whatever it is that you're doing at the time. We use uh, music and uh, timers a lot to delimit activities in the Ingenium, and so uh, you're pretty much under pressure with a small p uh, to perform, if you like, to a particular um, framework of time. And uh, the students themselves have a pretty low tolerance to uh, other groups that perhaps don't keep on track and aren't doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. They're each other's worst critics, believe me. The key innovations in the classroom are physical, not technical. We weren't expecting to find that. We expected the uh, ICT elements of what's in there. It is an ICT-rich environment, but actually the key things that we found, the key th lessons that we learned, are physical, to do with how you arrange a space, what you do with the furniture, how bright it is, uh, how breezy it is, and, uh, and how, how much you can physically move around. Talking about physically move around, the space definitely particularly suits the kinesthetic style of learner, the one who's used to learn by moving around and being physical. Um, a, a typical classroom of uh, desks in rows doesn't lend itself to that sort of learner. And I think possibly most importantly, the key findings are transferable to traditional classrooms. Nobody ever leaves the Ingenium after seeing an activity going, huh, well, of course, it's all very well, they can do that because they've got this, this and this, and they've got lots of money and technology and things. It's not like that at all. The key sort of findings that we found are, tr are transferable. So you could emulate the idea of having uh, group areas with whiteboards by having flip charts and group areas arranged with the furniture in a classroom, for instance. OK. Here's another quick question. We've got three items on the screen. Now this time, I don't want you to tell me which one's the odd one out. I want you to think about what they've got in common. Well, of course, there's lots of things that they could have in common, but what do you think I'm getting at? So we've got a ballpoint pen, a pocket calculator, and a mobile phone, a cell phone. 
OK, well, what I'm getting at is that they've all, at one stage or another, either have been or are banned in schools. I'm old enough to remember when ballpoint pens were banned. Why? Because they were felt to be bad for your handwriting. And pocket calculators being banned. Why? Because they were felt to be bad for your numeracy. And, well, don't even go there when it comes to mobile phones and schools. But what is it that we've failed to recognise about the, the potential of a technology like a cell phone, a mobile phone? If you could take a group of, uh, go back, say, 20 years into the past and talk to a group of teachers and say, in 20 years' time, there will be a device that's uh, about the size of a pocket calculator that runs on its own batteries for all day, uh, completely cordless, wireless, that can be connected instantly to any other computer in the world, that can access databases of massive amounts of information, that can take pictures and send them to anybody else in the world, uh, can take uh, audio recordings, can take messages on notepad, you can draw on it, and then send and receive that information with any other user in the world, that group of teachers would say, wow, what a fantastic uh, future lies ahead of us. I can't wait for that day to arrive. And the moment the day does arrive, what do we do? We ban them. OK, so where are we going with uh, our ingenium? Well, we're moving um, uh, uh, from being uh, a physical space to being also a virtual space. Uh, we're developing ingenium.org.uk. It's still under construction, but we hope to use that as a repository for uh, the things that we're finding and the lessons and activities that we're planning. We'd love to see you there, so do please drop us an email. And this podcast that can be reached at tinyurl.com slash yqk9rg. I'm Peter Cowney. Thank you for listening.